Microphone, ch 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 check. It works. Very good. Let's get started. This week, we want to generate random points inside of a circle. This is part of our procedural generation series. And why would you want to do this? For example, maybe you're doing level design and you want to make a little patch of grass here or uh, an area where there are more trees than usual, a grove of trees and so you want to place you want to place different objects inside the the circle. Let's get some different green for trees. So you want to place different trees at random points inside the circle. Or maybe Maybe you have a first person shooter, there's another example I like to use, and you're shooting at an enemy and you don't want your guns to be com per perfectly completely accurate because that's actually not as fun. So you want your shots to be slightly inaccurate and land somewhere inside this circle. So great. Um, so let's take a look at how you might do that. We're going to have two random variables. One is going to be theta and one is going to be r. Theta is a random variable in the interval from 0 to 2 pi, or in other words, 360 degrees, and r is a random variable in the range of 0 to 1. Okay, why are we doing this? Because theta is going to represent the angle at which we generate our point, and r is going to represent the distance or the radius from from the origin at which we generate our point. So maybe this distance right here is R. And then we would generate the point right here. Let's find another color for that. Our point would be right there. So I'm going to write a formula for how that point would be generated. Z is the point we're generating. And it is going to be R times the vector how do we get this theta and turn it into a, an actual point that we can use? Well, we use cosine and sine. Cosine, of course, is the x-coordinate. Sine is the y-coordinate. So cosine theta sine theta is going to be our point that we generate. Very good, except that we have a problem. Look at what happens if I generate another point on this same circle, okay? And let's assume for the sake of argument that these two points had the same radius value. Then look at the distance between these two points. And then let's, now let's maximize the radius value. Let's put the points out here on the edge of the circle and we can see that the points are much farther away from each other. What this means is that when we have lower radiuses, we're going to get points that are closer together than when we have high radius and then we'll get points that are farther apart and this will cause a clustering of points in the center of our circle. Now maybe you want that. Maybe you want a gun that is kind of mostly accurate in the center but sometimes has a shot that goes to the outside, you know. Uh, let's see if I can draw that here. You're going to get a cluster of points here on the inside and then the occasional hit on the outside. This is a design question. There's no correct answer here. Maybe that's what you want. Maybe you want it to be more dense in the center. Um, but math is a tool. And in the case that you don't want it to be more accurate in the center, in the case where you want a uniform sampling all around this circle, then we want to figure out what the math uh, is required that would give us that uniform sampling. And that way we have both tools and we can apply them in, a, in either situation, which is necessary. Now I'm going to draw a little graph here. Okay. Here's my graph. <clears throat> and we're going to try and visualize a little bit more why this is happening. Because it doesn't quite make sense. If this is the radius and this is the probability that we're going to choose each radius, then this graph is flat. This graph is flat. Okay, this is radius zero and this is radius one. And I mean, we're equally likely to pick any given radius. So then why is it that the circle is more dense at the center when our graph here is flat? 
And actually this graph has a name, I should mention its name. It is called a probability, prob, probability density function. Density function. Okay. And it represents the probability that each value of R will be selected. And we can see that it is a uniform. This one is uniform. Uniform. It is a uniform probability density function. So we can see that there's a uniform probability of any individual um, value of R being selected. And so why do we get this grouping at the center? It's because of this phenomenon that I described to you where the lower values are closer to each other than the farther values that are farther away. So if I, would, if I were to draw a three-dimensional probability density function, let's see if I can do this well. Okay. It would look something like this. It's kind of tent-shaped. Okay, there's a surface in the back here, and then here's the center of the... I hope you can see this 3D object fairly well. Okay, so you can see that if we're out here, the height, the height of the, here's how you read this, okay? You pick a point, let's pick a point out here, and then the height of the probability density function is the probability that we're gonna get a point there. And so if we're inside the circle, you can see the height here is much greater, and so it's much more probability that we're going to get a point there. Now, this curved shape, this curved shape, is interesting it's telling we want to cancel that curved shape out okay so we're gonna actually generate a new probability density function for our radius and let's do that here okay we're gonna generate a new one it's gonna look more like this Zoop. okay and instead of making it uniform we are going to make it like so. And this is actually a square root function, square root of r. So here's 1, 0, and 1. And here's the point 1, 1 right here. So you can see that if this is, if this is um, the identity function, this is y equals x right here, this is where the point would be but since we're going to take a square root and we're less than one, it's actually going to make our value bigger. So the actual value of the function is here. It's a little bit higher, it's a little bit higher. So if we picked 0.5, then we're going to get 0.75. Is that right? That's not right. What am I talking about? We're going to get about 0.707. So it pushes the radius of each point up and outward, outward away from the center, which is what we want uh, to even out this function to get values that are not clumped towards the center. We have to push values out away from the center. So we're going to get a new probability density function that looks something more like this. Okay, here's the center. This is another 3D object, but oops, but it's more like a cylinder. And so you can see there's anywhere that I choose inside this circle, inside the cylinder, the height is the same. So I have an equal probability of, um, of being at that point. So let's make a new formula, instead of r, we're going to do square root of r, cosine theta, sine theta. And that will get us a more uniform mapping. So the key takeaway here to remember is your probability density function, which represents what the probability is that you're going to choose any particular value of a random variable. So now let's go to the code and see how this works in the code. 
So here I've already created two random variables that will have a value between zero and one. And now it's time for us to create our theta. We have a value in the range of zero to one and we want a value in the range of zero to two pi. So we just multiply times two pi. Good. And for the radius, we're just going to use the number without modification for now, because I wanna show you what it looks like if we don't apply the square root yet. So in order to create our vector, we have to modify our random variable a little bit. We take the radius and we multiply it by the cosine of theta for the x part. Y, remember, in this coordinate system is our up-down value. So we're gonna leave that alone for now and we're gonna apply the actual y value to z sine theta. And that takes a sine instead of a cosine to get the, the y value. And then we multiply it times 50 so that we have a nice big circle instead of uh, instead of a, uh, you know, a not big circle. So we can see what's going on better. Okay, and here we are. And we can definitely see that there's a bit of a clump here in the center, right above my character where all of the squares are clumped together. But if we go out here to the outside, it's definitely very sparse here. You can see the clump there and, and my system is slow now because I have generated 800 of these. It doesn't like that very much. So, but anyway, you can see that they're clumped here in the center and they're sparse here on the outside. So that is what we are going to change by making this into a square root and recompiling and running again. And here it is. And now there is no clump of any kind to be seen in the center. It is entirely uniform over the entire space and again, this is running slow because 800 things is too many for my computer to render and record at the same time, but there it has it. So, great. Um, now, this I'm going to cut this series short because as interesting as I find it, I can always come back to it later, but I'm much more excited to start in a series of optimization uh, that I've been planning for a while. We're going to cover a lot of cool topics about how to make your game run faster using math, guys. I can't wait. It's going to be really cool. Uh, yeah, I'll see you next week.